Hey everyone, this is Nick and this is yet another big week where I had to cut a lot of stuff from that video. Maybe I should also make a podcast which includes everything and could be longer than these videos. Let me know in the comments if you would be interested in that. So, while there won't be any KDE news this time because they're all in Barcelona having a lot of fun at Academy, we still have Google letting the ad blockers and tracker blocker extensions live for a little bit longer. We have a new NVIDIA open source driver, which looks kinda nice and modern, and we have Debian including non-free firmware on their default installer, breaking with a decades-long tradition, among a lot of other cool things, like this segue to today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use, they are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to ads serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. Google has gracefully decided to stay the execution of your favorite ad blockers and tracker blocking extensions by delaying the removal of Manifest V2 support in Chrome. If you didn't follow this, I have a dedicated video which should appear up top, but the gist of it is that Google and Chrome, and by extension Chromium as well, will soon stop supporting extensions using the Manifest V2 spec, replacing it with V3, which severely hamstrings ad blockers and tracker blockers by preventing them from accessing the requests you make. Instead of killing off this support in January 2023, Google will instead only remove it from the experimental branches of Chrome, so Beta, Dev, and Canary. Then, in June 2023, Google will experiment with removing support in the stable version as well, and companies will be able to push that removal back to 2024 through their policies that they deploy to their fleet of devices and browsers. Users and extensions developers now have a little bit more time to prepare their migration either to the new API and its limited capabilities or to a new browser entirely if your favorite extensions are too severely limited. Although Google didn't say if they were planning to improve the new API that will replace web request, and that is the core of the problem with Manifest V3. So the delay seems kind of pointless for users in the end. If you use ad blockers and tracker blockers and you're currently a Chrome user, I would just encourage you to use something that is more respecting of user choice, like Firefox or Brave. But that's a personal choice. If you want to learn all the details about this major change, I left a link to my video in the description and it should appear somewhere up there. The Linux kernel version 6 is now released, and while the big number has gone up, and it is indeed a sizable release, don't expect incredibly major changes. Performance improvements are predominant here, with Xeon Ice Lake, Threadripper, and AMD Epic CPUs getting better thanks to scheduler changes and energy tweaks. Support for Intel's 13th gen and next gen Xeon chips has also started appearing, and RDNA 3 GPUs from AMD now have a kernel driver. And issues with Ryzen 6000 series laptops should be fixed with this new kernel version as well. There are also fixes for the ThinkPad X13S, which uses a Qualcomm Snapdragon 8CX CPU, so ARM-based, and there are also fixes for some Clevo and Tuxedo laptops, with touchpads and keyboards now correctly working after suspend and resume. The kernel version 6 will also be the first version to officially support Intel's Arc GPUs, which just officially released for desktops. So if you plan on buying one of these, you should definitely upgrade your kernel, especially since while these GPUs look pretty bad on Windows due to poor pre-DirectX 12 support, on Linux it shouldn't be an issue as all games go through Vulkan, basically. 
On top of that, version 6 also brings the H.265 and HEVC API to stable and adds a Raspberry Pi 4 3D driver. Depending on your distro, you might get the update or not, but I would absolutely recommend you wait for your distro to actually ship this kernel before you install it, unless you really, really need one of the big changes in this release. Looks like all this open source code NVIDIA dropped is finally bearing fruit. Not from NVIDIA themselves though, but from Collabora, one of the most prolific companies developing free and open source software. Jason Ekstrand has been working for months on NVK, an open source Vulkan driver for NVIDIA GPUs. He points out that while Nuvo can work, it was mostly written by reverse engineering stuff that was gleaned in CUDA documentation and by trial and error, which means that these drivers are not super reliable, they're incomplete, and they can't hope to match a proper driver based on real documentation. Involvement in Nuvo is also waning as developers get tired of hitting their heads on walls while trying to understand how things work without documentation. Since the latest NVIDIA GPUs now have a unified firmware blob that can make the GPU work well, and since they release their own open source kernel drivers and the 3D headers for a lot of cards, it's much easier to create a modern driver for these GPUs. And so NVK was born. The goal is to make it the reference NVIDIA driver in Mesa, and while it isn't ready yet, it's already in good shape. It only passes 10% of Vulkan tests, while the current AMD driver passes about 50% of them, so they are still a ways to go. But in terms of architecture, it's clean and stable. It's targeting the Turing architecture and all cards that release after that, although some patches have been submitted to support older generations. You can already try it out if you want, although it's absolutely not ready, so expect a lot of issues. But it's still super exciting to see finally we might have a good free and open source driver for NVIDIA GPUs, which either might make NVIDIA drop their proprietary drivers and contribute to it, or at least try to better support Linux through their proprietary driver. And now time for some GNOME app updates. Workbench, the tool that lets you experiment with GNOME technologies and libraries, is now officially part of GNOME Circle with version 43, which also brings changes to use the latest LibidVita components. Newsflash got yet another update, and the RSS feed reader will soon display tags in the article list and allow you to share articles through Pocket, Instapaper, Twitter, Mastodon, Reddit, or Telegram. Kuha, the simple screen recorder, brings a new UI to only record a portion of the screen. It lets you change the frame rate through the UI and lets you use VA API, as well as new codecs like VP9 and AV1, but as an experimental feature. Gay4, the UML modeling tool, now uses GTK4, remembers your favorite save folder, and fixes a bunch of issues. Tagger, the music metadata tagging app, now lets you download tags from music brains and receive UX improvements. Komiku, the manga reader, now follows the GNOME HIG more closely and has two display modes, including a compact one. Finally, Fractal, the Matrix client, has a new alpha release, which has been rewritten to use GTK4 and the Matrix Rust SDK. It's still missing notifications and red markers, but apart from that, it looks pretty feature complete. I'm absolutely going to give Newsflash a try, because all my news reading is done through RSS, and I would much rather use Nextcloud News synced with a desktop client than the Feedly website, which has a lot of issues. Major change for Debian this week, as they've decided to include non-free firmware by default in the Debian installer. Debian was always pretty firm on being as fast as possible, accepting the fact that some devices might not work well out of the box as a compromise for not including any non-free software in their ISO. This is now changing, as after debating on multiple options, including spinning up different ISOs for non-free firmware, letting the user choose at install, or other more convoluted ideas, the Debian developers have settled on adding non-free firmware by default on the general installer. They also updated the Debian social contract, their major document that lists the principles of this distro to reflect that, stating that the Debian official media may include firmware that is otherwise not part of the Debian system, to enable use of Debian with hardware that requires such firmware. The current ISOs aren't yet updated to reflect this change, but it should happen very soon. 
Basically, it means that Debian will be a much better option for beginners as they can expect most of their hardware to work as soon as they install, without needing to apply too much post-install configuration. The change is a very good one, in my opinion. It's always better to have distributions that will work on a lot of hardware out of the box, although it is sure to anger fast diehards and probably Richard Stallman as well. Time for some elementary OS 7 updates. During the past month, the team has worked on solving the major regressions that were blocking the release of OS 7. And there's only one left in Gala, their window manager, which means we might finally see this new version drop soon. The App Center has also been further improved with better release notes display, listing more than five previous versions, and the store will also now support displaying the various issues that the developers have fixed. A new overlay status bar has been added to show the description of tasks that are currently in progress instead of having a mysterious spinner that appeared in the header bar, so installing apps or updating repos will now be a lot clearer. And the update all button now sticks to the top of the list of available updates for easier access. The GTK4 port of the App Center, while not completely approved yet, should make it into OS 7 as well, with all its responsiveness and performance improvements. Now, if you have early access, access to elementary OS, you can already try out the new system settings app as well. Still no exact release date, but at least we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Although they really, really should release it soon because it's gonna get super outdated by the time it's out. And let's finish this video with the usual gaming news. First, while the Linux user market share on Steam dropped slightly to 1.23% of all Steam users that participate in the user survey, it seems that SteamOS and Holo ISO are now the biggest distro for gaming on Linux at 17%, with Ubuntu at 12.5 and Arch at 10.5, which means that the deck is definitely popular, at least among Linux users. Speaking of the deck, you can now buy it immediately. The reservation queue is done. And on top of that, you can also buy the official docking station as well, if you plan to use your Steam Deck docked and plugged into a monitor or a TV. Which should be a lot easier now thanks to the latest SteamOS update. Gaming on Linux has a nice video covering all the changes in this new 3.3.2 version, and I linked it in the description. But here are the biggest changes. You can now select the resolution and frame rate of an external display when docked, and problematic resolutions and modes will now automatically be avoided. Red Dead Redemption should now be fully playable without crashes, FSR should now be smoother with better frame pacing, the home screen has better performance, and there were a lot of changes to Steam input to better handle controllers and to make the flick stick settings work better. Flick stick being a mode where you can just flick one of those joysticks to quickly turn to a specific direction in game. Basically, it's the docked mode update, which is really, really great. And which also means that I should probably try and revisit my little Steam console that I made. It's a specific video that I made just before this one. You can check it out using the card up top. Basically, I took a mini PC and tried and see if it could match the performance of the Steam Deck because it matched the price and it kind of matched the specs as well. But I did have some issues plugged into my 4K TV with resolution not scaling super well and I could probably just change the resolution to 1080p on that TV instead of 4K to have better performance. If you're interested in seeing how a Steam console in a small form factor could work, check out that video. And check out today's sponsor. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. And why would you want that? Well, it basically saves you all the hassle of looking online to see if a specific computer is well supported under Linux, which components will need to be swapped, which components work, which don't. It's just a way easier method. You just buy a PC in one click and you know it supports Linux and you know that the manufacturer also supports Linux development. So they have a big range of devices that should cover every price point and every need from laptops, desktops, high-end workstations, lower-end ultrabooks. You have basically whatever you might need and you have a ton of customization options including your own custom keyboard layout if you want, your own logo on the lid, and you can have plenty of CPU, GPU, RAM, SSD options as well. So if you need a new device and you're tired of looking online for what is compatible and what isn't, 
head over to the link in the description below and grab yourself a tuxedo laptop or desktop. It's much easier. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't, well, you can also click that dislike button and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really want to help support the channel, I have a super thanks button underneath this video. There's a PayPal link in the description, or you can join my Patreon subscribers and YouTube members. Both links are in the description as well. And these guys get the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover, for example, next month. And they also get a weekly podcast that I make every Monday. So thanks for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!